Today's book is Sound Foundations by Adrian Underhill. Uh, this is yet another book that I've read for professional development, so it's not it's not pleasure reading by any means. Like uh, like especially this book is not pleasure reading. Um, so uh, this is another book I've done for the book club. I've got started at work, um, and it's. A, as with a couple of the previous books we've done in that book club, this is actually my second time through it. I first read this book a couple years ago, back in 2014, when I was doing uh, Distance Delta Module 1. Uh, so when you're doing the Distance Delta um, Module 1, they send you a bunch of practice exams, you write your answers, you send it back, they mark it, and then they tell you everything you got wrong and give you advice. Um, and one of the, I was having trouble with the phonemic script. And one of the pieces of advice I got from my Distance Delta tutor, she said, uh, Sound Foundations by Adrian Underhill is a good book to read if you're having trouble with this. Um, so, um, we had that book in my school library. I was able to track it down and, and I read it. Uh, and. Uh, I read it, we read it again for book club because the other people in the book club wanted to read it. Um, after we finished our last meeting, I said, okay, what, what are you interested in reading? I'm open for anything. Uh, and uh, some people wanted to do a book on pronunciation. Um, so this, this was a Distance Delta book recommended on pronunciation. So uh, this, I'll talk about readability first. Um, we had three people read this in the book club, and the general consensus of everyone is that this was a bit boring to read straight through, from kind of page one to page 200. Uh, I, I had trouble with this. Um, I was reading it, and I was doing that thing where, like, I was taking me so long to read it, just because it was so hard to focus on what, you know, the meaning of the words on the page. You, you know, you're kind of reading and you get to the bottom of the page and you're like, oh, I didn't, I wasn't paying attention to any of that. It was just so boring I was thinking about something else. And so then you go back to the top and, you know, it takes you forever to kind of get through this. Uh, and I was thinking, because I read this book before, a couple of years ago, I was thinking, what... Maybe it's just because it's my second time through it and I'm not quite as interested. I reread my book re review from 2014. And my book review from 2014, I had made the exact same complaint. That was just really boring and hard to concentrate on stuff. Uh, and then I thought, well, maybe it's just because I'm not interested in pronunciation so much. You know, like, uh, it's, it's never been the area of, it's never been an area that's particularly interested me. Um, but, like, I sent this question out to the other book club members, a couple other people reading this book, and, yeah, they had the exact same reaction I did. It was very hard to kind of read it from cover to cover. Um, not, again, like, it's not a, the prose level is not difficult. It's just, it's, it's, it's boring. Um, so somebody in the book club suggested that perhaps we it was never really meant to be read from cover to cover. That's more of a reference book. Um, I had my doubts about that because, like, it does seem like he's building an argument. Argument is the wrong word, but he, he's building on things as you go through. So, first level is sounds in isolation. Then once you figure out the sounds and you go to words in isolation, then once you learned how the pronunciation of words, you go to connected speech. And then the classroom toolkit kind of builds on the knowledge previously in the discovery toolkit. So I thought, like, is this really a reference book where you can just kind of open it up to it? I mean, like, it's not really designed as a reference book. There, there's no index. There's a list of classroom activities, but they're not really organized in any way that makes them easy to kind of reference. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it is, it is 
hard to kind of sit down and read it from page one to page 200. And that, that may be more reflective of my limitations as a reader than it is reflected of the book itself. But for whatever it's worth, this, this was also the experience of the other two people in the book club. Um, so, the book is about pronunciation. Uh, it's divided, it's, sorry, it's about teaching pronunciation to speakers of English as a second language. It's divided into two parts. First part he calls a discovery toolkit, and that's where you're kind of learning everything for your own benefit. Uh, so like, your, your own knowledge as a teacher, this is how we make the sounds, this is what your mouth is doing when you make certain sounds. This is kind of what's happening when these sounds gets put together into words. Uh, and that, that was interesting to a degree. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, interesting to a degree. Uh, and then the classroom toolkit, there's a lot of good ideas in this classroom toolkit. There are also, in my opinion, some ideas which are not so great, or at least they're not very practical. Uh, or... You know, some of these would require completely rearranging your classroom and, you know, taking up more time than the teacher may have available. Some of them are really great, though. Uh, you know, you, you get that with any teaching book. You know, some of the ideas are really great and you can use some of them, not so much. Um, now, there... Back when I first read this book in 2014, I read this for Delta Module 1. Uh, and it was boring, but I, you know, kind of thought, well, okay, you know, students need this, you know, you got to work on pronunciation. Uh, and I don't, I, do, I haven't been working a lot with pronunciation with my students, in part because uh, it seems it's a little bit boring. I'm much more interested in getting them talking and discussing ideas, maybe doing some grammar correction. I think the students themselves... This varies from student to student, of course, but uh, I feel like the students themselves a lot kind of find pronunciation work boring. Uh, but that's that's just an excuse. I mean, like, that's not a good reason not to do it. But after I finished this book, I read The Natural Approach by Stephen Crashing and Tracy Terrell. Uh, and there's, there's a couple paragraphs in The Natural Approach where Crashing and Terrell say, um, there's research on pronunciation, and it turns out that the amount of time that a learner spends in an ESL classroom working on the pronunciation rules has no correlation at all with their ultimate pronunciation ability. Uh, the only thing that seems to correlate with their pronunciation ability seems to be like uh, how their, their native language. Uh, native languages that are closer to English seem to get kind of pronounced better. P people with native languages that are closer to English uh, pronounce English better. Uh, working on all these rules, according to Krashen, who's, who's citing studies on this, doesn't actually help. And um, Krashen says, yeah, you can teach them the rules, the conscious rules, there are rules of pronunciation and these can be taught, but uh, the learner has other things to attend to. So the, I think the idea is uh, conscious attention is limited. Uh, it can focus on a limited amount of things uh, and you know some people think that on, only one thing at a time. It, you, can, you can only focus your conscious attention on one thing at a time. When somebody is speaking in a foreign language, there's a lot of balls they have to keep in the air. They have to remember the vocabulary they're using, they have to remember the grammar, they have to focus on what they're saying, like the message of what they're saying. Um, and so it's an open question whether these kind of consciously learned rules are going to benefit them at all in free production. Like, uh, okay, all right, I remember this is a B sound, so I've got to vibrate my vocal cords and uh, make a plosive with the lips. Actually, B is not so difficult. Uh, you don't, you're not moving your tongue. But, you know, the idea that you're thinking about what your vocal cords are doing and opening your nasal cavity or 
moving your tongue and all this you're keeping track of consciously while you're keeping track of the grammar and while you're keeping track of the message of what you're saying and the vocabulary and everything else um, is, is it's, it's a pretty good argument, really. And after I read that, I, I was like, oh, right, well, this whole book is out the window then. Uh, or at least the, the second half of it, when he talks about pronunciation activities. Um, or not. Like, all, all of this is in debate. I guess that's one of the, the things about second language acquisition, something that makes it interesting or frustrating, depending on your point of view. No, nobody agrees on anything. So all of these pronunciation activities are a complete waste of time, or, or not. Uh, Adrian Underhill is arguing for a sort of, I think the term is proceduralization model, where first you kind of consciously focus on the rules, and then with practice it becomes automatic. Uh, so eventually you get to the point where it's automatic. Um, the, he... Another, yeah, he, you, you can really get in a whole debate about this, about how much conscious pronunciation rules help the learner. And to a certain extent, that debate maybe is outside the scope of this book review. Uh, because it, it, it's, it's, he just takes it as assumed, really, in this book, that these conscious rules are going to help with pronunciation. Uh, the other thing that maybe not in this book, and so perhaps is outside of the scope of this book review, is, um, so, so like a lot of uh, the research into second language acquisition, I think has indicated that somebody's ultimate attainment uh, is connected with their, um, what's the word, integrative, the integrative something, so the, the desire to integrate with the language culture. So for example, <clears throat> If you want to be seen as an English speaker, like if you want to be seen as an American, you're going to have a high motivation to sound exactly like an American. Um, a lot of people don't want to sound like an American. They're happy sounding uh, like a French or a Japanese or a Vietnamese speaker or whatever. We, we were talking about this in the book review, sorry, in the book club. Um, you know, we're all living in Vietnam. Uh, and we, we don't particularly want to sound Vietnamese uh, when we're speaking in Vietnamese. Like, you know, we want to be understood, but like we don't want to be, we don't want to be the, be mistaken for the person who's trying too hard to fit in or something like that. We, we want to maintain our own kind of identity as Americans and we don't want to kind of lose that identity into Vietnamese even when we're speaking Vietnamese. Um, I, I, I think that's true of a lot of language learners. Uh, so people who do not have that integrative motivation, um, maybe all these pronunciation activities that kind of help them speak more like native speakers are going to be a waste of time. Um, and now this again I'm going to have to mention just in order to dismiss it because this is completely outside of the scope of his book and so I guess it's not in the book review. Interesting issues outside of the book, though, if you, if you want to open that wider debate. So, uh, the Discovery Toolkit, he talks about uh, how the words, how, sorry, the, the first letter, is, the first part is the individual sounds, how the vowels are pronounced, how the consonants are pronounced. This can be, this can be interesting to a degree if you've never studied this kind of thing before. Um, it is, I mean, it is the kind of thing that pops up in every kind of introduction to linguistics book ever. So if you've, if you've read anything about linguistics, you probably know this already. But um, in my case, the first time my attention was drawn to this was, I think, way back in 2010. I was uh, in preparation for going to, to study a master's degree in applied linguistics. I was trying to read up on it and uh, w had read uh, Steven Pinker's book, The Language Instinct. And I think that was my first exposure to this. Because, uh, you know, it's interesting to a degree, uh, all the things that you're doing when you produce sounds that you're not consciously aware of. 
Uh, and what I remember thinking was really interesting was a lot of the sounds we produce are actually controlled by the vocal cord. So for example, uh, the P and B, the P and B sound, your mouth, like your lips and your tongue and your teeth and everything kind of going on inside of your mouth is exactly the same. It's just whether your vocal cords are vibrating or not. Uh, and that's true for a number of consonant pairs in the alphabet. Uh, the K and G sounds, the T and D sounds, uh, the S and Z sounds, uh, the, uh, the th and the sound. Uh, it's, just your, it's just a matter of what's changing your vocal cord. And I thought, oh, right. You know, like I, I had no idea that T and D were actually just kind of the same sound, uh, minus, plus or minus the vibration of the vocal cords. And so, like, it's interesting, it's interesting, like, all the things that you know subconsciously, but you have no idea of consciously. Uh, I, I think this is, this is, this is true of linguistics in general, you know, kind of getting into all the grammar rules we know subconsciously and stuff like that. But, it, you know, it interesting. Um, and, you know, another thing that I remember surprising me when I was reading this book, uh, the letter H uh, doesn't exist, kind of. Uh, like, there's no articulatory position for the letter H. So, like, if you were to say to somebody, okay, how do you make the H sound? Like, you know, where, where, where do you put your lips or your tongue or something? There, there's no answer for that. The answer is... All H is, is just extra air before the vowel. So if you're saying ha, then you make your lips into the ah sound. If you're saying ho, then you make your lips into the o oh sound, and you just, you just push out extra air. So I, 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 was, I remember reading this, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Like, there's no, there's no H. Well, I guess, you know, I guess there is an H, but there's no articulatory position for H. And actually, I've used that since at parties or something like that, you know, dinners when the conversation is getting a little bit slow. I'll say, hey, did you know there's no such thing as the letter H? Uh, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion uh, starter if, if you're ever at a cocktail party and you need something to discuss. Uh, or, you know, like um, the consonants W and Y or Y and Y are actually just vowels <clears throat> in terms of articulation, but uh, in terms of how they spread across the syllable, uh, they function as consonants. But like in terms of articulation, they're totally vowels. Or uh, we, you know, uh, the approximants, the the L and R sound, are kind of close, somewhere in between consonants and vowels in terms of articulation. So uh, even though like you know, all of these are treated as consonants in our alphabet. They're kind of almost like vowels in terms of articulation. Um, so, like, yeah, all that kind of stuff I thought was interesting. Um, so, actually, apologies if I said this book was completely boring. There are these kind of moments of interest in it, especially in the first section as you read through it. Um, and really, uh, not, yeah, not only for the sounds, but like... Um, the the words, the connected speech, etc. It's it's interesting just having your awareness raised of all the stuff that you you do subconsciously. The the part I think where everybody in my reading group just really had a hard time reading this book was the second part, which is a list of classroom activities. Uh, some of these now again, like I said, uh, you know, it varies. But some of these, I'm like, oh yeah, that's that's actually a pretty good idea. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that or I'm gonna use that or something like that. But just in terms of like reading a book for book club where you start and just kind of work your way all the way through it is just, it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to just sit down and read as a book. And again, there's some debate about this in our book club, but the, it, it could be this book was just never meant to be read cover to cover like that, like maybe as a reference book. Um, one of the things I gained from this book, because it's, it's funny, like I've, I've, I've read a few books now on ESL teaching and stuff like that. 
Uh, and what usually happens to me is a book will have like a hundred different activities. You'll read through them all and then you'll only kind of retain one of them. I think you'll have one idea that will kind of strike your imagination. I mean a lot of them, a lot of them will sound good, but one of them will just kind of resonate with you and strike your imagination. Uh, and you'll go off and you'll do that idea and then it'll stick with you because you've done it. So once you've actually done it, then it's easy, easy to remember. Uh, or if you kind of save your old worksheets like I do, uh, then you have that physical copy of it. And then the rest of it just kind of fades from your memory. I mean, it seems like a bit of a waste, but I think I usually just get one good idea per, per book I read, usually. Um, the idea I got from this last time I read it, uh, three years ago, was the idea of using poetry in the classroom. Uh, and that, that, that was my kind of one takeaway from this book. He talks about poetry being a great way to teach rhythm and stress. Um, because, uh, yeah, because there's rhythm and stress in poetry. Um, where is it? He, he has these uh, Humpty Dumpty and then kind of identifying the word stress pattern and identifying the rhythm pattern. Uh, oh yeah, like, here, here's Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. So, you know, this is, this is something I never really picked up on, I guess not being a very poetic or musical person, but like, Aside from the rhymes here, each thing is kind of stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed. And that's what makes kind of the meter of this. And so he talks about Twinkle Twinkle Little Duck Star or Humpty Dumpty, which had the, has this word pattern. Or um, there was an old man with a beard. I don't know if I know that one. Um, so I... <coughs> I read this and then kind of maybe in kind of conjunction with like uh, Krashen's idea of doing a lot of input in the classroom, I, I thought I, I'll just do, give the students a lot of poetry. Uh, I, I didn't do a lot of these activities with them. Maybe I should have, um, but it just, uh, I wasn't so interested in, in, I don't know, it just seemed like it was... It seemed like it was a lot of trouble doing all those activities, but I thought I'll give them a poem every lesson. We'll read through it together, kind of all model it, we'll read it with the students, and then some of that rhythm would just kind of rub off on the students, maybe. Maybe it being a little bit overly optimistic, but uh, but I think I think exposure to this kind of stuff does help, like just purely exposure. So I started doing a poem every lesson with my. Uh, with my adolescent students, um, which which I I thought was a pretty successful activity. It was um, a little bit difficult to find thirty great poems. We had thirty classes in the term, so I found like fifteen great poems, and then like you know poems that were completely understandable for the students and had like good rhythm and meter and was entertaining for them, you know, like funny stuff, like shell serverless scene or something like that. Um, and then the rest of the time, I, the, I had 15 maybe not so great poems. Um, so that was, a, that was the one activity I took away from here, and it's, it's not completely what Adrian Underhill would have recommended, but that's how these things work. You kind of filter there's something in the book that will catch your interest. You kind of filter it through your own brain and then it becomes your own activity with that. Um, so, would I recommend this book? Uh, the first half, definitely. I mean, it's not, it's not pleasure reading, but like if you are teaching English and if you if you feel like um, pronunciation is a weak point for you, it, like in terms of uh, your own knowledge of how like these sounds are formed, first half of this book helps a lot. Uh, second half of the book, maybe just as a reference point, um, it's uh, the whole book is based off of the British model of pronunciation, which is frustrating 
for Americans. Uh, but uh, I guess that's nobody's fault. Um, it, it's funny, actually. The, the symbols he uses in this book uh, are different than the symbols of the pronunciation book that I was teaching out of. Uh, because the pronunciation book I had was uh, designed for American pronunciation. This is all British pronunciation. Even, yeah, even the symbols were different. Um, for the vowels, that is. Uh, I, th I think the consonants are the same. Um, so, yeah. Advanced warning for Americans. Uh, but, like, um, <clears throat> this, this is the book they recommend on the Delta, the Cambridge system, and stuff like that. Uh... I think I'll finish here. Uh, so to sum up, a useful book, if maybe somewhat a boring read if you're going to do it cover to cover.